Well, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Around the world, 2.2 billion people lack access to clean water. In 2019, 1 1.2 million people died because of unsafe water sources. And 1.3 million died because of lack of safe sanitation and hand washing facilities. I'm Karen Block, a Senior Vice President with WSP, a global environment advisory and engineering firm with 60,000 people around the world, focusing on making our communities great places to live. I lead our water business in, in the United States, and I collaborate with my peers around the globe on important initiatives like access to clean water and sanitation. I have the privilege of representing WSP on the Leadership Council of Water for People, a charitable organization with a mission to promote the development of high quality drinking water and sanitation services accessible to all and sustained by strong communities, businesses, and governments. Today's panel discussion is coming together to address the challenge of access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene, or WASH. This is a really invigorating discussion because it brings together the representatives of the many stakeholders that need to collaborate to make access to clean water and sanitation a reality at the community level. First, we're going to have a high-level overview from each of our panelists, and then we'll dig deeper into a facilitated conversation around the topic. So let me preview it for you. We always like to start with the end in mind. So first you'll hear from Dr. Majid Mosseini, who is the Scientific Director of the Rezo Center for Mobilizing Innovation, a multidisciplinary knowledge mobilization program at the University of British Columbia. He and his team have been working to address WASH challenges for multiple First Nations communities in British Columbia for over a decade now. He'll talk about how all the stakeholders had to work together to finally find the solution that would work for these communities. From there, we'll dissect the discussion with our other panelists who all have a role to play in the WASH solution. Nancy Sutley, Chief Sustainability Officer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, reminds us that the WASH challenge doesn't just face emerging countries even in well-established communities with resilient government structures in place and a history of leading with innovation, climate change is creating new realities in water supply that level the playing field. Then we'll hear from Marina, Marina Takane, who's part of the UN Water Global Analysis and Assessment of Sanitation and Drinking Water, or GLASS, within the World Health Organization. She has some fascinating insights into the sources of funding for development projects, and this is great insight for local governments to ensure that the projects they take on are sustainable. After Marina, we'll hear from Johnny Harris with the technology company Isadema, who's all tied up in the world of technology and startups. And he'll talk firsthand about developing the right technology for communities to keep it simple and sustainable and how to scale that solution for broad application. And finally, we'll hear from one of Water for People's co-CEOs, Samson Bakel who has spent his career in finance, strategy, and coordination of project development in emerging nations, particularly in Africa. So he brings really important insights into the criteria that Water for People uses to identify the best projects for implementation. In a minute, I'm gonna hand it over to our skilled facilitator, Andrea Geisen, who is the Net Zero and Innovation Director for WSP's Water, Energy, and Industry Business in the UK. And she's built her career bringing together water utilities, technology providers, and investors with the aim of accelerating new technology adoption to tackle key challenges. So the WASH topic and this panel are right up her alley. Before I turn it to Andrea, a few logistics. If you have questions for our panel, please put them in the chat. We'll monitor the questions and incorporate them into our facilitated conversation. Also, this webinar is being recorded you will receive a link to the YouTube recording after the session. So you'll uh, have the opportunity to revisit the conversation and share it with your friends and family. And we encourage you to do so. And so now over to you, Andrea. Fantastic, thank you, Karen. Um, and just to add my welcome to our wonderful panel today and to everybody who's joined us to listen to the conversation. 
Um, I'm not going to hold us up. I'm going to pass straight over to Majid and ask him to set the context from his perspective. Thank you, Andra. Uh, thank you, Karen, for, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Before I start, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm joining this panel, a wonderful panel uh, from the unceded and ancestral territory of the uh, Nascom Nation, uh, where UBC is resided. We are so blessed uh, to be in, the, in their territory. Um, what I want to emphasize right from the beginning is uh, the importance of uh, participation and engagement of uh, the public and residents uh, in any infrastructure projects, whether it's large community or a small community. And for large community, Nancy, my co-panelist can uh, elaborate further based on her experience. Uh, but uh, engagement and participation of the public and residents is particularly uh, critical in smaller towns or smaller communities because in there every single voice matters and they can impact the project and how the project uh, may lead and may end up with whether it's successful or not and it, we extend that to indigenous communities uh, this is even more critical one because of the role that the government has uh, uh, to play with respect to to UNDRIP, uh, UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, but also the aspiration and the desire of the Indigenous uh, people uh, for their self-government and self-determination. They want to be involved in the projects, in any projects that is happening in their territories for their communities. They want to be the co-owners, co-developers, and the ones that actually drive the projects, not to be told what is happening. And so this is very critical and we've seen it over and over uh, in many communities that we have been working in the past decade or so. And I want to highlight or give you an example of one case, uh, one very small community uh, of uh, several houses uh, that had been on boil water advisories for decades. And this community is very remote, uh, about hundred or so kilometers from the nearest town. About 70 kilometers of that is a logging road. What it means is that uh, many times of the year it's impassable and when it's passable uh, it's so poor quality in terms of the load, road that regular cars cannot travel there. You, have, you need to have a special cars to go there. So in such situation, the community had been in boil water advisories and the water had to be delivered to them by truck um, once a week. And you can imagine how difficult it will be for the community members to be relying on the bottled water that sometimes may not get to that particular community. And over the years, the government and engineering firms, um, they had difficulty to really bring a solution that is sustainable. And many previous uh, attempts have failed because of the exact reason of the remoteness and also having no operator, full-time operator available, available there. So once the community heard of a solution that we were working in the lab, uh, in our lab at UBC, they invited us uh, to work with them uh, to see whether that solution can be workable. So we had a one-year uh, pilot study uh, led by the community. The water operator was in charge. So he oversaw the project. Um, and we from university and our uh, consulting engineering partner, WSB, was uh, also involved. We were mostly uh, watching from outside and helping the operators when needed. So after the successful operation of the pilot after one year the community was convinced that it works and along the way they learned about the technology they felt it they knew how it works and how the operator could operate it so with that success they convinced the government that this uh, solution must be implemented so again with the help of our consulting engineering partner and the funding from the government this solution was implemented. And within a few months of implementation, the community went off boil water advisory for the first time after a long time. But what is important is that
Grazie. With respect to the operational staff, and again, with the lack of resources, the solution is still working, and the community has been off boil water advisory system. So, what I want to emphasize is that that community involvement and buy in from the beginning, and involvement of partners, regulators, government, and uh, engineering firms and researchers led to something that uh, a solution that could be sustainable and could be solved within uh, a few months. Perhaps I'll leave it at, here, at this point and pass it to my um, colleague and co-panelist, uh, Nancy. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, so uh, I'm with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which um, is one of the largest retail water agencies in the United States. Uh, the city of Los Angeles and serves the city of Los Angeles. It's four million residents and its businesses. Uh, in Los Angeles, the city owns uh, much of the uh, the wash infrastructure, the water and wastewater. Although they're in separate, organized in separate entities uh, between the Department of Water and Power and the city's uh, Bureau of Sanitation, uh, and from uh, you know, so we're very well developed. Uh, very sophisticated system uh, for both water and wastewater. Uh, accessibility to, to water and wastewater uh, systems is very good, and our water quality uh, is, is excellent. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we face a number of challenges, uh, particularly in light of, of climate change. Uh, and when one is really around just on, on coordination and planning uh, between the various uh, agencies that I have responsibility over both water and wastewater but really uh, our, our challenges are around um, water supply and the future of our water supply as well as affordability uh, for our residents and our businesses uh, we have uh, traditionally relied on uh, uh, imported water or water imported from outside of the of the Los Angeles region uh, either through our own supplies or through a large uh, water wholesaler but in every case uh, our water comes uh, this imported water comes from increasingly uh, stressed water uh, river systems uh, uh, throughout uh, California and the western United States uh, that are affected by prolonged drought and the impacts of climate change. And so, you know, we are looking increasingly and investing increasingly in uh, local sources of water through recycling uh, of our wastewater, through uh, capturing stormwater when we, when we do get rain, and most of all, uh, through water conservation. So in Los Angeles, um, we use less water today than we did uh, in the 1980s, even though we've added more than a million people um, to the population of the city. So we continue to, to make very strong efforts uh, to encourage our residents and our businesses uh, to conserve water and to, uh, to rely on water saving uh, devices. The second issue, uh, challenge is really around affordability. We saw a, a lot of uh, concern and a lot of issues related to um, the economic impacts of COVID, but, but that only built upon uh, the, the financial stresses that many of our, our residents um, have long felt. And then uh, California also, as, as a matter of state law, has a, a human right to water, uh, so trying to kind of um, operationalize that uh, and uh, help people um, uh, deal with some of the debt that they accumulated through the throughout the COVID period uh, continues to be, uh, be a challenge. In California, we literally have hundreds of, of drinking water systems. Um, some of them, like Los Angeles, are very large, very sophisticated, very well capitalized. Uh, but we have throughout California a number of small um, and underfunded systems, and those continue to uh, have challenges, and, and the residents of those communities continue you know, to face challenges, both from the ability to uh, afford water, 
uh, as well as uh, access to, to clean drinking water supply. But in one measure of um, sort of how our community is engaged uh, when it comes to water, uh, it's really around funding. Um, and uh, while we're primarily uh, funded through our water, uh, the rates that we charge uh, to, uh, for, to our customers, to our residents uh, for uh, providing them water, uh, we also have seen uh, at the at the local level uh, as well as statewide in California uh, that a real willingness um, on the part of our residents to tax themselves to provide for uh, clean water uh, and water and improve water quality. So there have been uh, over the last decade a number of bond measures at the at the state level uh, to fund clean water projects. Uh, and, and locally uh, in Los Angeles at the city level um, in 2004, uh, a measure uh, to fund clean water projects uh, passed with more than 74% of the vote. And more recently uh, at the countywide level, so Los Angeles County, which is larger than Los Angeles City, but the, and the largest county in the United States, 10 million people uh, passed. It's called Measure W, which is a tax uh, measure that will fund uh, out into the, uh, for many years, uh, clean water projects, uh, including nature-based solutions and with many opportunities for public participation in the development and execution uh, of those projects. So, um, you know, we, we continue to um, evolve our, uh, our systems to deal increase with the increasing um, impacts of climate change on our water supplies, uh, as well as trying to tackle these uh, challenging affordability issues. Um, thank you. I will pass it back to Andrea. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nancy, for for that perspective. And and I'm already seeing some synergies come through here in in some of the discussion, which I'm looking forward to exploring. Um, now over to Marina. Thanks, Andrea. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, Nancy mentioned funding as well, but I'll also be talking about funding um, because of course funding is a key part of the picture. And given that the end goal that we're all striving towards is sustainable wash services for all, um, the sustainability of the funding is also a key consideration. Um, I wanted to bring in an example from the WASH accounts, which is an initiative that was started about 10 years ago by the World Health Organization. So um, we at WHO, we don't really implement community level projects, but we do support governments, primarily in low and middle income countries, on various technical areas of WASH, including um, the development of WASH accounts which is meant to lead to better and sustainable services for everyone, including within communities. So the WASH accounts, or TRACFIN as the methodology is known, um, brings together all sources of data on WASH spending in a country, including data from government, from development partners, but also from NGOs and community-based organizations, as well as utilities and private sector. And basically we're trying to get as complete a picture as possible of WASH spending in a country. Um, and so WASH accounts have been developed now, we're in development in over 25 countries and we have increasing demand from countries to develop WASH accounts. And I think this is really an indication of the need that governments are seeing to get a clearer picture of who is funding the sector what the funds are being spent on and who is doing the spending and providing services, which is the first step towards being able to align spending with, with priorities and ensuring that the money is being spent where there is need um, and especially where there's unserved or underserved uh, communities and populations. And we know from our experience collecting data that it's often really difficult to get a clear picture of the spending in the wash sector in the wash sector because of the fragmentation um, in, in many, if not most countries. So the example that I wanted to bring up um, is a result that comes up pretty consistently across the countries that 
that we work in. Um, so, which is that in many countries, the majority of funding for the sector is coming from service users, so from households and other types of users. Um, and so, a typical example is from Senegal, where 70% of total funding for the sector is from uh, service users. Um, and this is in line with uh, global results that we've collected through the GLASS survey, the Global Analysis and Assessment of Sanitation and Drinking Water, uh, where the most recent results show that 69% of funding is coming from service users. Um, this is a result actually from our yet to be released report, which we're just in the process of finalizing, um, which will be launching in December. So, you know, please keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, and this result, I guess, because we work primarily in low and middle income countries, this type of result often comes as a surprise to governments and other stakeholders because there is generally a perception that somehow donors and development partners are some of the majority contributors to funding of the sector. Uh, whereas in many countries, the donor contribution is only around 10% of total funding to the sector. So, I mean, the, the snippet of good news is that in terms of, sus of sustainability of funding of the sector, um, it is good news because a lot of it is already coming from within the country. Um, but of course, the big issue in many countries is that, you know, it, it's not enough. Um, and there are still many communities that are unserved or underserved. But what it does seem to indicate is that um, if the services meet the needs of the communities of the service users, then there is a certain capacity to pay for the services. Um, of course, affordability is an issue, as, as Nancy mentioned, and that's an, another area of work that, that we're also working in. Um, but just to say that this is one example of a result from the WASH accounts. Um, it's a really fascinating topic, I think. Um, and so if you find this interesting, I really encourage you to, to look us up um, and, you know, happy to provide additional information. So back to you, Andrea. Many thanks, Marina. And really interesting to, to hear that, that that willingness to pay is, is not just a developed country position, it's also, um, it's also very abundant in the, in the economies, the emerging economies you're, you're looking at. Um, so, Johnny, over to you. Thanks, Andrea. And it's great to be here. I'm coming to you guys from South Africa today. Um, so it's my afternoon for many of you. I think it's the morning. So I'm not native South African, but it's become my home and it's become a, a country which I care deeply about. We, we, we often hit the news for the wrong reasons um, and we're trying to, trying to get some positive stories out there. So um, my background is I'm a civil engineer. Um, so I've worked sort of in the water and sanitation space for the last 20 years. Um, started a consultancy called Isadema in 2014. Isadema is um, from the Isikosa word for dignity. So water is life, sanitation is dignity. And, and really that's, that kind of captures our passion because our passion is to, to see restoration of dignity, not just to, to, to the environment, but to, to the people. And, and, and we've worked very much in that space where you see pollution of rivers due to lack of service provision. And, and our heart space is to see both of those um, restored, both, both the communities and, and, and the environment. And interesting to hear from Nancy about the water stress that they experience um, in their rivers and, and the water stress that we experience in many of our urban rivers here in South Africa is very different. Um, we, we have obviously the, we have the droughts, uh, Cape Town experienced one of those a few years ago, um, but we also have um, heavy pollution from solid waste, from, from fecal contamination. And, and when we talk about polluted rivers, we're talking about 12 million E. coli per 100 mils. So the, the wastewater experts amongst the audience would, would, would think those numbers are impossible and it, it is about four times more concentrated than a normal domestic wastewater um, flow so we're talking about highly polluted waste and and it's not it's not because people are, are massive massive polluters it's due to a failure of technology um, and it's also the concentrations are also due to to the the efficiency of, of water that's that's happening in our dense settlements so water is is used and reused so, so our waste streams don't have the dilution that, that you might see 
um, in, in, in the more developed countries where, where, where your fecal contamination is heavily diluted by, by shower water. Um, so, so yeah, we've kind of been on this journey um, and just learning the impact of technology um, and the failure of technology on, on pollution of, of our rivers, but also in terms of the health of our communities. Um, so my engineering background is civil and I've become more and more involved in the green space. Um, I kind of now struggle to describe myself, whether I'm a green engineer or an ecological engineer. Um, but, but what we do do is we do try and work um, with nature-based solutions as much as possible. Um, and, and, and my career has primarily been as a consulting engineer. And, and what we've, what we've realized is, is to have the impact that we want to in the space, um, we, we can't just work on a single project each time. And so we've been working on developing technologies that can actually have a much broader impact and, and just to help support the effort that's that's happening in the social space. So we fully understand that, that you know, 80 percent of the issue is is a social one. It's due to uh, a lack of, of, of services as well. But if we don't get the, the 20 percent effort right in terms of spending the right investment in appropriate technologies, then 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 technologies are doomed to fail. Um, and so we've 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 spent some time yeah focusing on that, um, and and there's two two kind of main offshoots really of, of technologies that we've have evolved through our uh, our development. The one is is called the Aramlu. The Aramlu is a is a low flush toilet, flushes on two liters of water. Um, the Aramlu is based on the Aram lily. Some of you would call it the Kala lily. Um, the lily is a natural vortex, and we take that principle into the toilet to create not only beautiful looking um, toilets but also um, highly functional toilets and and what we learn when we look into nature and we look into um, nature-based design is really to make sure um, we give space um, where it's needed we understand about natural flow paths so we understand about the role of of biological and ecological treatment um, and 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 what we really are, are trying to push from a technology space it's not the high-tech solutions there's plenty of, of of companies doing that. There's there's a there is a need, and 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 we don't we don't take away from that. But we also know that that in the context where we work, that our technologies can't be too can't be too sophisticated. There's too many examples in Africa of of treatment works that have failed because they can't be maintained and they can't be repaired. And so the technologies that we really try and focus on are focused on on ease of maintenance. So I don't believe there's such a thing as a, a zero maintenance system. Um, but if we can align the maintenance of the system with something that is 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 akin to local skill sets, whether it's gardening or farming, um, then actually these technologies have got a greater chance of succeeding um, to provide the services that our communities need, but also to protect our rivers um, against pollution. Um, so yeah, so we've worked in everything from from the toilet, as I've just described, um, up to sort of 300 kilolitres per day treatment works for treating brewery effluent. And what we've done there is we've taken we've taken the brewery effluent, um, treating it through constructed wetlands, which we're actually growing spinach on. Um, so it's not fecal waste; it's it's organic waste. Um, that spinach is then is then grown and sold to the local market. That local market um, is, is is both getting the benefit of fresh vegetables, but also that is financing the maintenance of the system. So those are the kind of ecosystems and designs that we try and try and bring into into the system and and. And, and bringing those technologies together into things like school sanitation. So in South Africa, um, we've got about three and a half thousand schools nationally that don't have proper sanitation. And so by bringing together the low flush toilets with with the uh, with the ecological wastewater treatment works, um, we're trying to be water efficient. We're trying to recover water for flushing, and 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 put in services that can be maintained um, locally um, for the health of our learners and and and. And, and for the efficiency of the water. So yeah, so in summary, um, we, we, we had the privilege of getting comment from Peter Morgan. Some of you might have heard of him, but if you haven't heard of him, you've, you will have known about the pit latrine or the ventilated pit latrine. Well, Peter is the guy who designed it. Um, we think that dry sanitation is fantastic, um, but we also know there is a need um, for, for flush toilets in certain applications. And, and Peter, um, won the 2013 Stockholm Water Prize and, and his quote in reviewing our technology was that nature gets it right every time. And, and we really firmly believe that, that this, is, this is the avenue that, that needs to be pursued for our, our more decentralized treatment works where we've got a bit of space 
um, where we maybe haven't got the high skill set, um, but but where we where we can actually really bring a, a beneficial technology. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Johnny. And um, yeah, I'm really keen to explore some of those messages around um, what makes adoption uh, of technology key, because I think we've heard some really similar themes emerging from what you've described there to, to Majid's earlier, earlier comments. Um, so we'll look forward to exploring that more in the discussion. Um, but before we get there, um, Samson, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Samson Bagala. I'm one of the two co-CEOs for Water for People, and uh, I have been asked to provide a brief overview of uh, what criteria Water for People uses to select countries where we work, or districts where we work, or the kind of projects that we fund. Uh, just by way of a background, Water for People is uh, an international non-governmental organization and uh, we promote the development of high quality drinking water and sanitation services accessible to all and sustained by strong communities, governments and uh, businesses. And uh, in the last head, we have been working in nine countries in Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America. And uh, in the last year, since we developed our new Destination 2030 strategy, together with our Destination 2030 Alliance Partner Organization, IRC WASH, we have been looking into uh, starting work probably in one or two new countries in Africa, but also with an understanding that there are still a lot of people who do not have access to water where we are headquartered in the USA and also where we have a sister organization in Canada. We've been exploring how would we determine what our involvement, what our contribution, what our role should be. So uh, starting first in terms of our uh, plan to start new country programs in Africa, we currently work in three countries in Malawi, Rwanda and uh, Uganda and uh, we wanted to look at all the other 51 countries and see using some rational, some pragmatic criteria to narrow it down to one or two countries and uh, in the first stage what we did was we felt our impact could be greater if we focused in low and lower middle income countries in Africa based on national income levels and that already narrowed the number of countries we explored to approximately 40 and then we looked at a number of uh, pragmatic and programmatic considerations such as with all our three countries currently being in the eastern half of Africa would it make sense to start a new program in the west or in the north etc we felt it wouldn't be efficient to do that at least uh, for now uh, we also looked at some of the practical challenges like having our programs in Africa and India, which are all English speaking countries where we work, and then Latin America, which are all Spanish speaking countries. Every document, everything we do has to be translated into two languages, and meetings have to be translated, etc. And we felt starting work in a third language country could be more complicated, at least for now. So we decided to focus on English speaking countries in Africa, but also with our destination 2030 strategy focusing more what impact we can achieve by strengthening national systems while we also do the local level work in selected districts. We felt starting a new country program in countries where 
the size of the population is at least similar to the countries where we have programs now would be more uh, practical. And finally, we also looked at the cross learning that has been going on among our countries in uh, Malawi, Rwanda, and Uganda, which are next to each other. And we felt starting a country program somewhere in the West, even if there are English speaking countries or uh, countries with large population, we will lose that advantage of uh, sharing and cross learning. So that kind of narrowed it finally to uh, five countries in the east eastern part of Africa. And uh, after visiting each of those countries for a week and having a lot of meetings, particularly with national government and local government leaders and UN agencies, other civil society organizations involved in either service delivery or advocacy, etc., we narrowed down our choice to one country, Tanzania, and uh, we've just completed our registration there and recruited our core team. And uh, we are looking forward to starting a new program next month. And then in the USA, we felt it's completely unacceptable that there are more than 2 million people without adequate water or sanitation access. And we felt doing nothing is no longer an option where so many of our colleagues, so many of our supporters are based in that country. So we are at the moment looking at partnering with a very well-known organization within the sector in the USA called Dig Deep. And we are planning to co-convene the first US WASH sector gathering in Washington, DC in October. Uh, we've endorsed legislation, including the WASH Sector Development Act of 2022, which is currently in the Senate to force the Environmental Protection Agency to uh, improve access to water and sanitation services. And also we are planning to pursue additional opportunities for convening lending our voice advocacy and learning in the US, US WASH space. And in Canada, as I mentioned earlier, we have a sister organization there called Water for People Canada. And with our board of directors there, we are reviewing the results of uh, a recent assessment to identify possible action areas where, for example, replication of a successful First Nations Water Authority in other parts of Canada or partnering with an existing Canadian non-profit organization to develop simple but innovative water solutions not traditionally funded by the government. Uh, thank you. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you, Samson. And thank you once again to, to all of our panelists for setting the scene so well. Um, I mean, I've, I've already mentioned it a couple of times, but it's interesting to hear across these diverse geographies, diverse income levels in the countries that, that you all are working in. Um, we are, there are many synergies in terms of what, what success looks like for um, WASH projects. Um, but what I might actually do um, is put each of our panelists on the spot um, and just um, ask the question around, you know, what, what, what do you see as those top three critical success factors um, for, for the types of, of projects that you are either working on or working to enable? Um, and uh, I, uh, Majid, you draw the short straw. I'm going to run through our panelists in the order that you presented. Um, so if I had to ask you for your top three, what, what would those be? If it, if I say in terms of top three, um, I have to think about all the top, uh, all all of them. But really, the uh, we see a lot of uh, activities that are happening, uh, that are a lot of experiences that are happening um, around the world and, and within each country. So 
I, I think um, collaboration um, among various organizations is very key in terms of bringing um, successes and bringing um, um, something that is really where needed um, in terms of resource efficiency. Uh, Samson just mentioned about things that are happening in um, in Africa um, and also the, the plan for the US and Canada. Uh, a lot of experiences um, exist within organizations such as Water for People uh, in developing countries that can be applicable in, in, in northern or developed countries as well. In Canada, we have thousands of um, communities that are not funded by government. I'm talking about indigenous communities. Non-indigenous communities, that's going to be even more. Um, so they are really needing a solution that can work and the experiences that are out there can, can help them. So that's one. I already talked about the, the, the community participations, really hearing uh, from them. Often when we go to the communities, we, we just really want to bring our own solution rather than tapping in the, the local knowledge that is out there. So that's really the second one, I would say. Uh, I'll leave the third one for now to think a little bit more. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's you did a brilliant job there, considering I put you on the spot, Majid. Um, Nancy, how about from your perspective? Well, uh, Majid, uh, I think uh, summed it up well. I think it is it, the issues around collaboration here in Los Angeles are very important, um, not only among agencies, since we have a sort of an alphabet soup of agencies who, who work mm -hmm. on water and wastewater, uh, throughout uh, this region, um, and but also collaboration with uh, with the public, with uh, with the academic institutions, with our uh, partners like you know, what WSP and other engineering firms that help us do do our work. So I think that's incredibly important, um, and um, yeah, and I think that kind of leads to the other part about uh, which I agree with Majid around the en engagement with the community um, whether it's in here in LA uh, responding to to the drought uh, by by really uh, very um, sort of tactical personal commitment to reducing uh, you know their per basically per capita water use uh, uh, as well as uh, engaging the public on some of the solutions uh, to our um, persistent water quality and and uh, water supply issues. So uh, things like uh, doing more nature-based solutions for uh, stormwater pollution, uh, as well as the things like uh, uh, water recycling. Um, so that so bring it, building that um, kind of public buy-in. Um, and then it's just, I guess the last is just uh, really around uh, around funding and ensuring that uh, we both have adequate funding to uh, to take on a number of these projects, uh, but also uh, with always keeping issues around affordability in mind. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Nancy. And Marina, to you. Yeah, thanks. I think a lot of the key factors have been mentioned, um, but I think from our perspective, since we're working a lot with governments, um, a key factor for success for us is really government buy-in um, and government leadership. Um, and, you know, we've really found that if the government wants to develop watch accounts, it happens. If the government's not really interested, if it's a partner sort of, you know, nudging them along, then it tends to be less successful. Um, I think linked to that and a second key factor is stakeholder buy-in, so not just from the government side, but for key stakeholders, whether that's development partners, NGOs, community-based organizations, um, private sector, you know, uh, the key players in WASH in the country, if they're not um, if they're not brought in from the beginning and unless they see the value of, uh, of an initiative like the WASH accounts, they don't share the data, um, it, it all gets very complicated. And I think a third factor um, along the same lines as what Nancy was mentioning is, you know, this collaboration communication. 
So, you know, even though we are working with data and monitoring and it sounds very quantitative and um, and sort of like, you know, hard numbers and things like this, it, it really comes down to um, sort of like these softer aspects, um, communication, collaboration, buy-in from key stakeholders. Um, so, I mean, to me, I, I think that's a, a, key, a key lesson is that, you know, uh, even even in in the very quantitative aspects of of, of wash, there is always like the the softer aspects that are really essential um, to to ensure that you have those aspects um, in place uh, to ensure success. Fantastic, thanks, Marina and Johnny. From your perspective, yeah, thanks, Andrea. I think Marina took all my answers. I'll, I can show you my writing, but. Um, I think you know it wouldn't be it would be out of place if I didn't say technology is key, um, and that would definitely be one of my priorities. But in terms of of what makes it the right technology, you know we've worked on projects where we've spent two years in a co-design process with communities to develop the design, and and the design is often you, you know it's trying to speak to the pains of that community, and and maybe lack of services is one of them, but there's also uh, a need for employment, there's also a need for security of housing. And, and, and what we've really found is, is the critical factors, you know, to get that stakeholder buy-in, which I was going to say, um, is, is really to ensure that the technologies that are developed are, are appropriate, but also create opportunities um, that speak to some of the other priorities of the community or of the key stakeholders. Um, you know, so whether it's ease of maintenance for government, whether it's employment opportunities um, for the communities um, themselves, um, for me, that's key. And, and then that really kind of then links into my my final point really which is related to to the serviceability or the maintenance of of the system it's got to be you can't start with the technology without a proper maintenance plan um and and that's really where you know if you do a proper co-design process select the right technology and, and make sure we've, we we can engage properly to develop a, a suitable um, maintenance plan then actually you know your maintenance can create the employment but it can also create additional revenue streams so you know, sometimes we we plant cut flowers or we plant other produce, not not necessarily edibles, um, because of the potential health risks, but but other other value crops that, that could actually be grown on a system um, that that creates additional revenue. Um, so for me, I think that's that would kind of sum it up. Brilliant, thanks, Johnny. And and finally, Samson, hardest job because everybody has already had their had their say. <laughs> thanks, Andrea. I'll just emphasize one point. I will not repeat what others said. I think. Uh, one of the most important things from our perspective is really supporting the national and the local governments to strengthen the sectors in each country because we are there only for a limited period of time and uh, it's the responsibility of the governments to provide those services either directly or through private organizations etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, for us it's uh, uh, really vital to partner at national as well as local level with governments in each of the countries where we work. So ultimately the services will be provided better, but also the millions and millions of dollars invested on infrastructure will be sustained for uh, a number of years because we know so many of those infrastructure facilities failing after just uh, a few years of investment. So thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Samson. And um, I'd like to come back to that point about building capacity in the organisations that are there for the long term stewardship, particularly in the light of, um, I guess, Nancy's point earlier about the myriad of organisations that, that have a role to play. But before we touch on that, um, uh, we've had a question that's come in um, and um, I think uh, Majid and Johnny will be best placed to, to pick this up. Um, and, and Johnny, in particular, you touched on the fact that you co-design with the community um, to make sure the product is fit for purpose. But how do you then go about um, finding uh, manufacturers that, that can bring that to life and make sure that the final solution is, is economically viable? Um, and so maybe, Johnny, if you could pick that up and then we'll hand over to Majid to see, to see his perspective as well. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, it's very difficult. <laughs> I think is the answer because we are you know we're a technology provider but we're not a manufacturer and so I think this is a very relevant question to us um, for us we you know one of the keys 
when we've been sort of seeking sort of um, manufacturing partners is to to find manufacturers who share some of our passion. So it's not just about the bottom line for them. Um, and, and we've needed that not not just um, to get the price right, but in terms of their commitment to to see the development through to to a good to a good conclusion. Um, so in terms of yeah, I think it would really be to try and target and try and focus and find manufacturers that that share some of the the passion behind what you're trying to achieve. They understand the pain and, and they're willing to to walk a journey with you in partnership. And thankfully, we've we found that with the Aramlu. Um, I think any other manufacturer might have given up a long time ago, um, but they really pushed through and, and helped us to problem solve and, and come up with a with a good solution. Yeah. Fantastic, uh, Majid. Any any thoughts on that? Well, um, over the past decade or so, the, as we've been working, we've developed this model. We call it a community circle. Really, what it means is that all the partners that need to be at the table uh, towards the success of the solution, they need to be involved uh, as early as is possible and manufacturers are one of the one of the partners or one of the stakeholders that need to be there so um, as johnny mentioned their passion is very important their commitment to the to this kind of approach the collaborative approach is very critical uh, the second thing that uh, is very key we found is really the community is the one who needs to pick the manufacturer as well so they need to feel that the, the manufacturer is committed and want to work with them uh, over a long term, as opposed to just one time bringing uh, bringing a solution and then deploying it there. And lastly, we try to uh, source it as close as possible. So the manufacturer, if possible, very local. So if there are issues, they can just easily go and change or um, address any uh, follow-up matters that come. Brilliant, thank you. And and yeah, those themes of, of collaboration, shared values coming through again really strongly there. So so that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've had another question that comes in that that um, somewhat aligns with it, where I was going to take the discussion next. Um, so the question that's come in is um, how government approaches to tackling water challenges are different in different parts of the world, and which branches of government are involved. Um, and I guess I'd like to add to that my my own question, which is um, certainly when I look at the the UK context, we have a range of different organisations involved in in water stewardship. Um, so in the water uh, in the wash life cycle, um, and we are often operating in silos. And so I think in in the developed world, we've we've perhaps moved too far away from the the point of use, and we now need to to bring those organizations back together to foster better collaboration. Um, and, and part of that challenge is that it is different government departments often and different um, policy organizations that are actually regulating those, those organizations. So I'm going to uh, pop the question to Nancy first. Um, so, so thinking back to that question that was asked, uh, asked by the audience around uh, which parts of, of government are involved, but also, how how do you feel um, things need to evolve in the in the U.S. context or in the, the indeed the California or the L.A. context to to better align those those organisations those stakeholders? Yeah, I think that there there's no doubt that um, we have uh, the the way that water is managed, um, you know, both. Uh, water and wastewater is is pretty fragmented, uh, not just in California, but I think uh, across the U.S. Uh, and and so we've we've done some things to try to um, you know try to deal with that. Uh, but I guess generally, you know, we have uh, water purveyors uh, at the at the local level, most of whom, at least in California, are are uh, public agencies or our uh, units of government, um, and then a whole regulatory structure at at the at the federal, state, and and local level, uh, and you know, and different um, sort of configurations when it comes to uh, whether uh, the the uh, agencies, the the water providers, are both water and wastewater providers, or just water providers, or in our case, water and power providers. Uh, so you have every different uh, configuration uh, you can come to, uh, but increasingly, um, 
and and over the last you know 10 or 15 years <clears throat> in Los Angeles, we've really tried to uh, break down some of those silos um, and and get into this <clears throat> sort of one water concept where you know a single drop of water. Water has many purposes and goes through many life cycles. Excuse me. <coughs> Start coughing. <coughs> Let me stop. Yeah, Nancy, maybe we'll we'll just take a break. And and Samson, um, I'd be interested in your reflections on that from the the countries that you work in. Yeah, th thank you, Andrea. That's a really good question and. Uh, uh, it varies from country to country, even within the same region in Africa, for example, where we work. And uh, I think our approach has been, obviously, we have to be respectful of the systems that exist in each country and uh, adapt our work to fit within the systems that exist in each country. Uh, it could be sometimes like water is in one ministry and the sanitation and hygiene is in another ministry and in those kinds of circumstances what we try to do is to support coordination mechanisms that are led by the government an appropriate unit of uh, uh, the government and also when there are certain challenges to either gather data evidence and provide that to demonstrate perhaps some sort of tweaking or adjustments etc that may be necessary sometimes to take uh, representatives of different government officials from one country to another country where we feel the systems are working better in particular areas so that they can themselves you know visit learn and appreciate and take the initiative to uh, you know uh, make any adjustments that they believe are appropriate in their contexts thanks andrea Brilliant. Thanks, Samson. And um, Nancy, I'm, I'm conscious um, we cut you off. Is, is there anything um, anything you wanted to to just finish on on that your earlier point? Uh, just uh, just the last thing to say is I think that this model, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, of a collaboration is now not just um, you know, coming from the ground up. It's now the condition of uh, both either the regulatory or the funding regimes that are sort of, uh, whether we like it or not, kind of forcing people uh, across agencies to work together. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. And and I guess just just building on that, um, Marina, I'd like to come come back to you just for a final point. Um, so from a from a financing perspective it, in a way it's it's really reassuring to to hear that there is that that willingness to pay although um i use that with caution given that uh if you that that people need to buy access to these services and it is a need um but i guess one of the questions i just put to you is in terms of the governments you you work with um with the wash accounts um, are there particular structures that that you see that stand out? And I'm not necessarily I'm not asking for the detail of them in the closing minutes, but are there particular uh, structures that you see that stand out that that really have been successful in terms of then putting the money that's available, the funding that's available to work? Um, and and are there any particular countries we should look to for for successes? Thanks, Andrea. That's a really interesting question. Um, and I think, you know, we see very different um, types of situations um, from different countries. I did want to raise, um, I think, uh, uh, of the countries where we've implemented, where we've developed WASH accounts, um, one example that really stands out is India. Um, so we developed WASH accounts for two states in India, and what really came out there was um, the massive amount of, of government funding for, for WASH. Um, and of course, through their Swatch Bharat mission, um, they, they did invest um, hugely into, into the WASH sector over a number of years, and that came out really clearly um, in, in the WASH accounts results. But also, you know, uh, we see also in the increase in their access 
uh, numbers. Um, and of course, not to say that <laughs> this is a model that can be um, emulated by, by you know, uh, many other countries. Um, but I think um, what really stood out to us there was that uh, that government leadership and that government um, buy-in uh, on the importance of WASH was uh, really key to increased investment in the WASH sector, which led to increased access for users and the population. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess if I were to bring up one example from a from a country where uh, we saw, you know, interesting results of, you know, how uh, the the funding structure really ended up influencing um, uh, outcomes and access rates, I think that's one of the standout examples. Brilliant. Thank you, Marina. And I think that's a fantastic point to wrap up. I'm conscious we're we're just past the hour. Um, so Majid, Nancy and Marina, Johnny and Samson, thank you so much for your contributions. I'm walking away with a view that engagement and participation, collaboration are really the key themes in terms of success around WASH um, and, and the provision of WASH services. Um, and I think, you know, there's some really interesting themes that have emerged about seeking multiple benefits from the, uh, from the solutions that we're implementing and doing that very much with the communities we're implementing them for. Um, and it's really interesting to hear that that extends not just to uh, the developing um, economies that, that we're all working in, but also to, uh, to, to the developed world. So thank you again for your participation. Huge thanks to all our, our, all our participants who joined us. Uh, we hope this was useful and um, look, forward to, uh, look forward to learning more on the topic. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.